about caves collapsing. So I don't know why this talk was put up just before we are going into the mines, but uh, <laughs> bad timing. Um, yeah. So I'm sorry about the title. I tried to make a title where there was hype in every word except V and of. So it's a, it's a simple story, really. So there will, uh, there's really only one message. Mm, no. So uh, we're used to thinking of the Earth's crust as being solid, <coughs> and it's not. Uh, there are huge bubbles under us, and. Uh, that's what I'm going to talk about, and especially when these bubbles meet the surface, because what's happening is that when one of these water-filled or air-filled bubbles gets big enough, then the roof will start collapsing, and uh, this material will fall down to the bottom of the cavity, and therefore you get a kind of bubble effect where the bubble is rising, the roof is being removed, and the floor is being built up, so this whole cavity moves upwards in the crust. And at some point it meets the surface, and then we get some kind of disaster, which I will talk about. And, uh, of course, yeah, this picture, of course, is from a Voyage to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne. There are a number of small scientific issues with this <laughs> concept. Uh, one of them, uh, why there is light there, for example. But another problem is that when you this bubble gets this big and when it's far down in the crust, then this roof uh, will not be able to support itself. It's too big, unless it's very, very uh, steep sloped. Okay, so uh, when these holes meet the surface, then we get what we call a sinkhole or a dough line, or a tiankeng, there are many words for it. But these are enormous cavities that uh, hit the uh, surface of the Earth. Yeah, they can be small as well, but they, are, they can be very, very big. And it's m mainly in limestone terrain, where you have dissolution of limestone at depth. Uh, so just some, uh, a few examples. If you search for sinkhole on, on Google, as I did here, you will get thousands of spectacular examples. Uh, and uh, some of these sinkholes, they can be uh, seven, eight, nine hundred meters deep uh, with vertical walls. Um, some of them are actually submarine, like the big blue hole in Belize. And we believe that this formed when the sea level was lower. So they actually formed on land, and now they are drowned by, uh, by the sea. And when they are water-filled, we call them C-notes, uh, or K-notes, and they are uh, found all over the world, but a lot of them in Mexico, and they were sacred sites for the uh, Mayas in particular. Uh, yeah. And sometimes these uh, bubbles, they hit the surface in populated areas, and there are many examples of it. Uh, Guatemala City, uh, they, in the last few years, they have had two big uh, accidents with these uh, sinkholes. This was maybe the most spectacular two years ago. Uh, yeah, the, this hole is maybe 100 meters deep, and it swallowed a number of buildings, and I think uh, a few cars, and uh, sometimes people fall into this and are, are, are killed. Uh, this situation is not really limestone dissolving. This is uh, pumice, volcanic material, that is being washed away by groundwater. And especially when you have sewage pipes and water pipes that leak, uh, they can, through the years, they can wash away material and uh, you can get a collapse like this. Now, one interesting thing here, which is the main point of my talk, really, is that... Uh, it seems that these uh, sinkholes, they attack from rather large depths. It's not that you have a cavity just below the surface and then it collapses. They actually, there is a cavity far down which suddenly shoots up. Uh, and the question is why that happens. And it's not only on Earth that we have these uh, uh, sinkholes. This is from the Moon, where there are lava tubes uh, under the surface. Uh, tunnels, 
Uh, sometimes they have collapsed along the whole tunnel, and then we get what we call a rill, which you can actually see in telescopes from Earth, small telescopes. Uh, but this is quite a spectacular example of one of these uh, skylights on the moon. So you have a tunnel going in some direction here, and you have a collapsed doll line like this. This has been suggested as possible sites for human habitation on the moon, because you are protected against radiation and other things. Uh, and then this one. Uh, this is maybe the most spectacular sinkhole in the world. Uh, there are bigger ones, but uh, this is probably the most beautiful one. Uh, it's the Sotano de las Golondrinas in Mexico. Uh, and it's basically a relatively small opening uh, on the surface, maybe 50, uh, less than 50 meters diameter. Um, and then it opens up like a, like a bottle, so it widens out. And uh, I think this scale is slightly off because it's more like 370 meters drop from this edge here and down to the bottom. And then there is an additional uh, couple of hundred meters of, of shaft down from that again. Uh, so this is as 747 per scale. So you, you can put uh, the Eiffel Tower in here, yeah? with good margin. Uh, and this is a picture from the inside. Uh, so you see this skylight at the top. You get rather uh, confused by the geometry because you're not used to seeing this kind of thing when you are inside. So when you are inside, it looks like the walls are vertical and go straight up to the opening, whereas actually it's tapering in and it's a small opening at the top. And what's important here is uh, you see this uh, fault uh, going like this. And this fault goes along the long axis of the cavity and probably this cave has formed here because of groundwater circulating in, uh, along the fault and dissolving the limestone. And the material at the bottom is uh, rubble, collapsed rubble that has fallen down from the roof. Yeah, and you see all these uh, layers here, which I will come back to, they are a bit confusing. So there are basically three ways of getting into this hole. Uh, <laughs> Uh, either you can do like this, and this is not allowed anymore because it disturbs the, the uh, bird life in, the, in this cave. Uh, yeah. So you can base jump in, or you can uh, rappel in, and that's what we did. Or you, in one case there was a hot air balloon that I managed to just <laughs> maneuver into this hole, and that was a very dangerous operation because it was very, very close to the walls and it would have damaged the balloon and it would have fallen down if they had been torn by the limestone on the edge. Yeah. I, can, yeah. I will not say much about this field work, but it's uh, <laughs> quite a strange experience. You can imagine rappelling down from the top of the Eiffel Tower if you have been at the top there. It's quite high up. And this is opening up like a bottle, as I said, so when you are hanging down there, then it's maybe a hundred meters to the closest wall, so you are basically hanging in, in free air. And one thing is to get down, but then you have to go get up again on the same rope, uh, rope and it's, uh, yeah. yeah. Just another picture from the bottom. Yeah. It looks small, but it's really quite big. <laughs> Yeah, so actually, uh, <laughs> I think uh, this one, which is, a, this is a mine shaft here in Kongsberg, and we went down that one actually as training before going into this one. That's about 70 meters or something. Yeah, and then from the bottom, and it's really, really huge. You can see, uh, this is just one small corner of the bottom of the cave. You can see uh, Stein Erik Lauritsen there for scale, for those who know him. Uh, and, yeah, by the way, this, this pile here is maybe 10, 15 meters tall cone. And that's uh, bat uh, guano, because there are about 2,000 bats living in this cave. And they're, yeah. 
and and also there is a fantastic uh, this is called the the the, um, the cave of swallows is the English name because there is a population of maybe 50,000 or 100,000 swallows living in this cave and uh, they come up every morning to go out and forage in the, in the rainforest or, and then they come back in the evening and then there is this fantastic uh, rush of birds coming into the cave and they can't go, they can't fly up of course <laughs> this vertical shaft so they have to circle around in a spiral uh, and then they come shooting out so it's a big tourist attraction to just see these birds coming in and out in the morning and evening and then there is this very interesting uh, layers in the rock here and for a long time I thought they were primary stratification in the limestone and uh, I had gone down up and down this cave a couple of times before I s it started to dawn on me that this is actually not primary stratification but it, it follows the topography of the floor of the cave so when you have a depression down in the cave then these layers go down into it so these I think are actually and others have suggested that as well, that these are actually uh, paleo uh, surfaces of the floor because the floor is going down because of the solution at depth and this is all rubble so it will just go down and down and down and these are old uh, floors uh, of the cave and then a couple of crucial observations on uh, the nature of the rock here First, it's bedded, and these beds are maybe one meter, uh, typically, uh, thickness. It varies a bit, but we can assume something like that. And it's also jointed. Um, so you can see these cracks going along, these joints. And this combination of the bedding and the jointing means that this rock is basically a, a, a grid of limestone blocks that's rather convenient if you want to model this um, yeah. so just a few words about arches because the, that's important here how this roof of this cave is uh, maintained and how it can collapse uh, so if you look at the oldest type of arch that was made uh, called the corbel arch or uh, false arch uh, you basically just uh, pile bricks on top of each other and then you just extend these layers in until you get uh, an, an arch and if this overlap is too uh, small then this will break off because of the load from the top so you have to have rather small steps uh, yeah. So then you typically see that the, sh the shape of this arch is a triangular because you have a certain maximum overhang that you can have on each layer before it will collapse on you. Yeah. So this is rather similar to the situation in the Sotano de las Colondrinas. If you think of these bricks as limestone layers and these lines here as the joints that go vertically. Yeah, so just uh, a very, very simple rock mechanical model of this then. It's, I don't want to model this as a continuum because of all these joints, which is completely controlling the strength of the material. So instead I make a grid. I'll come back to that. Uh, and I look at each of these layers individually. I can do that because... I can regard, I can look at this layer here and then I rec can regard this bit sticking out here as a beam a cantilever lever, lever beam that is supported at one end and then it's simply loaded from the top and at some point it will, it will bend down because of this load and at some point it will break and then I can do this for actually for each of these layers individually in the simplest model and I start from the bottom and I see if this breaks and if so I break it off then I look at the next beam above and see if that will break because of the load above and then I take that away in each time step. So it's just a simple beam uh, model. Mm. Yeah. Some of you know this. It's, uh, it's this thin 
uh, beam approximation. So you, uh, you assume this is very, very thin compared to the length uh, of the beam. And you make some other simplifying assumptions as well. And then you end up with a simple uh, fourth order uh, differential equation. Yeah, it's not very... One little detail here is that uh, this width of the beam obviously look, seems to be important. Uh, and this is kind of the distance into the wall. Uh, and of course, the wider the beam, the stronger it is. But on the other hand, you, it also gets heavier, and the load above gets heavier. So this term actually cancels out, so you don't need to worry about the uh, width of the beam. So and Then we make this very, very simple two-dimensional model. So it's a grid where each row in the grid is a limestone layer, and these are the joints. And then each cell can either be a rock, or it can be air, or it can be groundwater, uh, which is dissolving the limestone, or it can be this rubble that has fallen down. So in each time step, I dissolve uh, limestone where it is in contact with water. And I do this beam uh, calculation for each of these overhangs and see if they break. And if they break, then these bits fall down and form rubble. This rubble will usually be dissolved quite quickly. So it's a very simple uh, model. But there is overhang though? I mean, we do have, there are stacks like this, so they're not like shown here. But... You mean in nature? Yeah, no, yeah. both. I mean, in the model too. I mean, we have it, there is some sort of overhang between the. Now, this is the overhang, yeah. Oh, okay. This is the overhang. This is air. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, this, what, what's holding the block up above the block there? This one, right there. What's holding that up? Yeah. It, this is a beam that is attached here. Okay, so that's all. Yeah. This, this beam here will bend down by its own weight and the weight of the rock above, and at some point it will fail. Yeah? And then uh, it will look like this. So this is uh, 100,000 years, 200,000 years, all the way up to 900,000 years. So we start with a very small uh, cavity that is being dissolved. And this is not the first time step, this is after a little while. And you can see, for example, here, the pink stuff here is this collapse rubble. Uh, it's a bit unrealistic uh, how this is piled up. I don't make any complicated model for how this material is avalanching, etc. It just falls down until it hits something. Uh, yeah. And this, by the way, is uh, measured profile of the Golondrina's cave. So we did this by when going down the rope, or actually when going up the rope, uh, we took laser uh, distance measurements every, I think, every two meters or something. So then you get a profile like that. We also took uh, LIDAR. We digitized the whole interior of the cave using LIDAR, but that data set was, uh, it's not so easy to use this simpler method, get a better result in a way. Okay, but the interesting thing here is that you get this catastrophic shooting up of, of, uh, of pipes. You can see here you have a more or less round uh, cavity, and then very suddenly you shoot up these pipes, uh, and they can go up 100 meters or more. Uh, let's see if we can get this movie to work. Right? It's very dramatic events. I'm also, uh, the, the surface is also being eroded or dissolved or whatever. whatever. And I also, I don't let it uh, dissolve at the bottom. I say I have some layer there which is not dissolvable. That's just so it doesn't disappear out of the bottom. Another thing here, I can adjust all the parameters. In this particular run, I have a water table at this level. So there is actually no dissolution going on above that, because that's air. I could, uh, yeah, I have tried all kinds of parameters and it doesn't really matter much. Uh, yeah. And you get this shooting up of, of pipes. And another thing is, uh, when this uh, thing starts to meet the surface and the sinkhole is formed, then the load from the overlying rock is reduced. So therefore it can support 
uh, more overhang when it uh, gets closer to the surface. And actually, it starts, it stops collapsing it, from, from about this time. Yeah. From some time point there, it stops collapsing because the roof is supporting itself because the load from above is so small. Of course, if it continues to dissolve laterally, at some point it will probably collapse because of the width of the roof, but uh, it becomes quite stable. But uh, again, the uh, main point here is this catastrophic shooting up of pipes, which means that this uh, sinkhole can attack from a rather large depth. Mm, yeah. So there is this particular geometric situation, which I call the Dome of Doom, uh, <laughs> which uh, can cause this catastrophic shooting up of a pipe. And it's quite simple, really. It's just that when you have a large overhang at the bottom and you have smaller overhangs above, uh, then what can happen is that when this bottom layer collapses, yeah, then this falls away and you get to this situation. And then the overlying layer has an even larger overlap. So that will definitely collapse. And then the next one will collapse and you will shoot up uh, like this. And it can only be... Uh, it can be it, it, this shooting up can stop in two different ways. One is that uh, when it reaches the top here, uh, you will get one continuous layer in the roof, we, and that layer is supported from both sides, not from only one side. So that layer is much stronger. This layer above here is much stronger than this one because this one is supported on both sides. This one is supported only on one side. So therefore, it can happen that you can continue to get this shooting up, but then you end up at a flat roof with no cantilever beam at either side, and then it will stop. Or it's because of the reduction of overburden. When this pipe reaches a shallow depth, then the overburden is smaller, and then the event stops. So if you just plot from the simulation, uh, uh, 100,000 years, so this is 100,000 years, 200,000 years. And this is the magnitude of collapses, so that's simply the number of blocks that fall down in one time step. Then you will see that there is some initial small uh, collapses, and then it starts to become periodic. So you get one collapse every, I don't know, 20,000, 30,000 years. And then it stabilizes, seemingly, until you suddenly get enormous events, which you saw in the movie. And then after that, it stabilizes on a kind of periodic pattern with large collapses, and then you wait 10,000 years, and you get a small collapse, and you wait 10,000 years. And it goes like this. Uh, so this is something that uh, is actually testable, which we would like to do to look at the collapse rubble, take core, cores uh, at the bottom of the cave and see if we see these periodicities. Because there are small streams at the bottom of the cave, and they are laying down sediments. So you actually have a sedimentary record at the bottom of the cave. Uh, this is a co core like that. So if we can find these periodicities in this core and date material in the core, then we can test this. So this is not like uh, self-organized criticality or something like this. This is a periodic collapse with a certain characteristic time. So just uh, finally about uh, another type of arch, because this was the false arch where you have uh, layers of bricks, for example, lying flat, and you just taper in the opening. But then, of course, people discovered that you can uh, do like this instead, and I wouldn't need to bring this picture because you have it over the door. That's the more smart way of making an arch, because in this case you manage to translate all the forces into compressional forces that are diverted down and out. Yeah. And that's called a Vossoir beam, or a true arch. Uh, and that is a totally different situation. And then the most stable arch is not triangular, but it's some other shape. And if you don't have any load from the top, 
Then the most stable uh, arch is a catenary curve, and that has been used in, in classical architecture. Uh, it's been used in uh, cathedrals as well and things like that. This is one of the more spectacular examples. This is very close to a catenary curve. Uh, yeah. mm. So to model that kind of thing, you need to uh, <coughs> um, include all these joints and all the contact between blocks. And there are different ways of doing that. One is the uh, discrete element method, where you calculate all the forces between blocks, or there's something very similar called discontinuous deformation analysis, which is used more in geotechnics, which is that you model the displacement of blocks instead, but it's uh, basically the same thing. Uh, and there are it's very complicated software for that kind of thing, or you can use uh, something like Angry Birds. That's just the same. Uh, this is a discontinuous deformation analysis. So it, it calculates the uh, displacement of all the elements, and they drop down, and when they meet something else, then they stabilize them. So it's actually a relatively advanced uh, modeling behind that kind of thing. Uh, That's really all I had to say. As I said, it was a short and simple story. It's simply how these catastrophic events happen. Uh, so I've just gone through these sinkholes or Tiankengs or Breccia pipes. Yeah, Breccia pipe, by the way, I forgot to say. <laughs> uh, uh, this is when you have this bubble rising in the earth. Uh, then, of course, it will leave behind a rubble at the bottom. And all this rubble will form a chimney or a pipe, which can extend for quite large vertical distance, and you see these pipes on seismics from the North Sea, for example, where they have formed probably in, in connection with salt that has been dissolving, and have formed these uh, breccia pipes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it's very necessary to use discontinuous models for this. It's no use doing a continuum model where you don't take all these joints and layers into account. Then I just show this simple model, which reproduces the natural morphology and gives oscillatory collapse with occasional large events that give us shooting pipes. So I just want to thank these people. Simon, he did the actual laser ranging. And then there was a huge team of uh, Mexican cavers that helped with uh, the field work in Mexico. So, yeah.